Okay, so how is everyone today? I don't have it. I don't okay. have it. I mean, okay. I've got it. So how is everyone today? Good? Very good. So. How are you? Oh, I'm good. After all the times I said that we're having a quiz this week, I forgot to give the quizzes to the testing center until like 11 o'clock today. And so some of you actually were there before that. Go, go you. Uh, so sorry, the quizzes weren't there for you, but they're there now. Uh, hopefully, hopefully this doesn't occur again. Uh, any questions before we continue? Any questions? Yes? I'm not missing where the scans have been posted. No, you're not missing it. They haven't been posted yet. That's still... Yes? Um, is it okay, like, since we've already handed the homework, to maybe ask questions about the homework? Or is this something that you prefer to, to wait for? I prefer to wait because I post, video, I post keys, both video okay. and PDF. And if you have a further question, then ask. Okay. It's, it, th these math courses are like... We, we get, like, 45... Uh, instructors get 45 lectures. And really, we have about 55 lectures worth of stuff to do. Just, that's, that's life in the big city. Yeah? Are the keys included in there not being, not been posted yet? Those are posted. Those are? Yeah, those are posted as of an hour ago. Oh, okay. So, and I sent a message about it. Other questions? Okay. So, last time... Last time, we were talking about defining the angle between two vectors. And we had come to uh, the following situation. Uh, we were saying that suppose we have two vectors. Uh, so here's vector uh, x. And remember, we're... we're it, and at this place, we're construing x to be an increment, which means that it's not, it does, it's not located anywhere. Okay? For it, usually, when we draw them, we draw them with their tails at the origin, but this, this is an increment. It's not located at any particular place. Uh, here's another vector, y. So now, these two vectors are not located in, in any particular place, but now I'm saying that we've put their, their tails together. Okay, then suppose, suppose that uh, we draw the one that goes from the head of one to the head of the other like this. So we talked about this last time. Uh, if you were to add these two vectors together, that would be a vector that looks kind of like this, this long diagonal of a parallelogram. What is this one? This is a subtraction, right? So this is, either, this is either x minus y or it is y minus x. Which one is it? It's x minus y. The reason is because the positive sense of every vector is from tail to head. Tail to head. But if we say that, well, you are, you are to travel from tail to head, but you have to travel along y and x, then Starting here and traveling along y, are you traveling in the opposite or same sense as y? Opposite. So it's negative y, and then from here, travel along x. Are you traveling in the opposite or same sense as x? Same. So this is negative y plus x, or if you like, x minus y. I hope I didn't do it exactly the opposite in the notes. I probably did <laughs> on, on Thursday. Whatever, it doesn't matter. So, so, what we want is this angle theta between, uh, between vectors x and y. That's what we want. And we had already discussed that if this theta, if this theta happened to be a right angle, then we already, we, we, we can, we already know uh, a significant relationship between all these length measures, okay? We know uh, the Pythagorean theorem. If, if theta were a right angle. So if theta was pi over 2, then we would know uh, that the hypotenuse squared 
is one leg squared plus the other leg squared. If it happened to, if it happened to be a right angle. <coughs> so if they're not a right angle, so otherwise, then we can make a slight correction to Pythagoras and say that uh, it's, the hypot it's, it's the opposite, not a hypotenuse now, but the opposite side length squared is equal to the one adjacent side length squared multiplied by the other adjacent side length squared and then minus twice the product of the side lengths times the cosine of the angle between them. And what's the name of this? The law of cosines, right? The law of cosines. So now, let's, uh, let's work on each of these. So I'll call this, I'll call this equation, uh, equation one. <coughs> So considering the left-hand side of equation one, the left-hand side, since x minus y, <laughs> that's my same ring too. <laughs> I went straight to my phone. <laughs> okay. So the left-hand side, uh, x minus y is a vector, and we want its length squared. But remember that, that length is, is defined in terms of dot product. That's what it is. So what this is, that's uh, x minus y dot x minus y. So that's the left-hand side. Let, let's, let's carry that out. OK. <clears throat> so I mean, this is, this is literally just like FOIL. OK, so FOIL. So the f term is x dot x, right? So x dot x, and then the O term is what? Minus x dot y, uh, minus, so plus negative x dot y. And then plus the I term is what? negative y dot x. Uh, and then the L term is uh, plus y dot y, because those negatives will cancel. OK. So do we have a simpler way, a slightly more compact way to write this? Length squared, right? It's this one. That is to say, these two are the same. Are even even these two are the same. They're the same thing. So this first one is length squared. And now let's consider uh, x dot y and y dot x. How are they related? They're the same. They're the same because, uh, well, in the <laughs> if you look at the definition, you can you can see that they must be the same. So if you have uh, vector x and another vector y, then the dot product is ant x transpose y, x transpose y. And uh, you can see that as the sum of the product, the sum of the products of the coordinates of x and y. And so you can commute each one of those, and then it commutes. So these are the same. So this could really be written as negative uh, twice x dot y, so we get two of those, <clears throat> and then plus, uh, plus that much more, so plus length y squared. So this is, this is the, uh, the left-hand side of equation one. So now setting, setting that equal to the right-hand side of equation one, we get length x squared minus twice x dot y plus length y <coughs> squared is that all that stuff. Length x squared plus length y squared minus twice 
length x, length y, cosine, angle between. Now, do you see that there's a great deal of cancellation that will occur? Those cancel. Length x squared cancels. The length y squared cancels. And then once all the length squareds are gone, then what? Then the negative 2's cancel by division, right? So these cancel with subtraction, subtraction, and then cancels with division. And you're left with x dot y is uh, length x, length y, times the cosine of the angle between them. Wow, so something that you already knew, <laughs> right? So this is, this is something that you, you, you probably knew from your Calculus two course, and if not that, then a physics course that you've taken, right? Because in physics you say something like work, right? Work uh, of, two, of one vector working on another is the, the product of the lengths multiplied by the cosine of the angle between them. Good. So any question about this? Okay, so what, what this is, the, the purpose of this remark is for you to understand that, that the notion of angle here is exactly the notion of angle that you've always had. Yes? Did they get that first when they were deriving all this? In history? Yeah, did they get that first and then the law of cosines from that? Or? No, the law of cosines predates oh. reckoning in terms of vectors by millennia. Yeah, ve vectors, think, think, thinking of things in terms of vectors is, at least in the modern sense, uh, maybe 200 years old. Whereas the law of cosines is ancient. Other questions? Okay, <clears throat> good. So, good. now we have, we have an exercise that's floating around about projections. So let's, let's remember what projections are about, and I'll try not to spoil the answer to the exercise. Before we talk about projections, I just want to make a brief <coughs> remark to remind you of something. And that is that if you have a vector x, vector x, and if you were to go ahead and situate it at the origin, so that we put, we put its tail at the origin. Go ahead and put it there. And now we're going to consider uh, the, the line segment that, or sorry, the line that passes through x in the following way. <coughs> then um, please remind me, what would happen what would happen if we multiplied this x by 2, say? What would, what would occur? What would you see? Right. It would be, it would be twice as long, and it would be uh, pointing in the same direction. So, so this vector here, this would be 2x. Okay, and then 3x and 4x and 2,451x, etc. Ha <laughs> ha. And then, what if we uh, say multiply x by negative half? Then what would occur? Correct. It would be it would be half as long, and then it would be pointing in the opposite sense. So it would be something like this. So this one would be negative half x. Okay, assuming, assuming that we've arranged all of this so that they are all, their tail is at uh, the same point. That's all that you really need. They all have to be at the same position. But for, for, for simplicity of argument, I'll just say that that's the origin. Okay, so... Now I want you to imagine that we've got, we've got, uh, you know, we've got some x that we're holding still, and then we're multiplying x by various scalars, like two, two and a half, three, negative, whatever. And I want, what I want you to imagine in your mind's eye is that the the head 
of this red x vector is able to move back and forth on the line. As long as it's over here, we're multiplying by a positive constant. And if it ever goes over here, that means that we're multiplying by a negative constant. And the further it gets, the, the further the head gets away from this point right here, the, the, the larger magnitude we're multiplying by. So, so if it ends up getting way over here, are we multiplying by positive or negative? Positive. positive. And relatively big one, like maybe like eight or something like that. Okay? So, this is the definition of projection. So let x and y be vectors in Rn. And then in the same fashion that we always do, uh, I want, I'm going to draw this picture in, in two dimensions because you can always put the tails of x and y both at the same point, the origin if you want to be definite. And then the heads of x and y are two other points. That's three points. Well, three points define a plane, so I can draw it on a plane. That's a legitimate thing to undertake. So if this is vector x, this is vector x, and then here's vector y. What I want you to see is that um, if we were to take uh, vector x and multiply it by um, a scalar, if we were to multiply it by a scalar that's between 0 and 1, for example, then this, this right here could be tx. So why would it be, why would, for this particular one that I've drawn, why did I say that t has to be between 0 and 1? It's, in the, it's, in the, it's pointing in the same direction, so it, it must be positive. Okay, and furthermore, it's shorter than the red one, so it has to be between 0 and 1. Okay, so, Gesundheit. So, now, what we want, I want you to imagine that we can move t around, Make t, you know, we've got a little dial, if you like. We can make t bigger and smaller. And I want you to imagine we're making t bigger and smaller, and it's wiggling around way over here, big and positive, over here, small and negative, big and negative. Okay, we want the, we want the t, we want the t so that this vector right here, okay, so what's the, what's the formula for that vector? So what? <laughs> it's one of these, <laughs> right? So remember, it's always tail to head. So, but you're, but we're not going to travel this way. We're going to travel on the other components. So opposite of y, because we're traveling in the opposite sense. So negative y, and then plus tx. So tx minus y. We want to select the t, we want to select the t so that, so that um, this, this drawing will cause this angle right here, so that angle right there to be a right angle. So you can imagine, it, it, we're, th currently the t is too big, right? We'd want a smaller t because that would cause this to shrink, 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 shrink until it's straight up and down. So this is the one that we want. Everybody understand the, the purpose of T? We want to make it be a right angle. So that's, that's one of your homework exercises. I'll leave it to you. Uh, once you figure that out, the projection formula is, is this. The projection onto X of vector Y is, well, let's think about it. It's got to be uh, x dot y over x dot x 
x. Is that right? Yeah, that's it. <coughs> okay, so let's, let's take a, a brief look at this for a moment. Um, so, this one is missing its hat. So, x dot y, what kind of thing is that, scalar or vector? Scalar. And then x dot x, what kind of thing is that, scalar or vector? Scalar. scalar. So that whole thing right there is a scalar, okay? And then this is a vector, so scalar times vector it is, is a vector. So notably, the projection, projection is a vector, okay? One of the cardinal, a cardinal mistake that you could make on an exercise that, that, that students frequently make is they report that the projection is that. Now, what you can see, what kind of thing is the thing that you can see? It's a scalar, right? Because it's the ratio of two scalars. So that's a scalar. So when you leave that off of the formula, that's not just like, oh, you forgot something a little bit about the formula. Okay? That is, you're handing me something that's categorically wrong. It would be like if I said, okay, I need you to go to the store and get a red apple, and then you come back with a red fire truck. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not even, it's not right. Okay. Good. So, now, the T, the T for this case, uh, in this particular drawing that I've, that I've given you, would T be positive or negative for this drawing? It'd be positive. It'd be positive because the T that we want would put our answer right there. Okay, and this thing right here, this vector, that's the projection. Uh, projection onto X of Y. And that particular T would be positive for this drawing. It could, is it conceivable that T could ever be negative in a possibly different drawing? Yeah, so what would I need to do to, to arrange it so that the T we're looking for is negative? Yeah, if, I, if we were to keep X fixed, if we were to keep X fixed, uh, then I could, I could start twisting Y to be on the other side so that here would be an example of a drawing where T would be negative. So here's X. Here's y, <clears throat> and here is the line that x determines. And what what this is what this is talking about is that you want to find a multiple of x, so that when you draw from y to here, you hit a, you get a right angle. So you want this. So if we, were to, if we were to multiply x by half and keep its tail in the same position, then it'd be like that, right? So to get, to get it pointing in the other direction, to get it over here, so here's a, here's a tx that's not quite long enough. What is the SIGN of this t? Negative, because it, it's, it's pointing, it's causing the result to be pointing in the opposite sense of x. Okay, good. So any questions about this? Was there a question? Yes? So uh, the scalar over scalar uh, fraction half, uh, it's not wrong to say that as t inverse negative, right? That is t. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but don't spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> You still have <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> yes? Um, if the vectors are orthogonal, then t would be 0. So does that mean there is no projection? Uh, no. Yeah, well, it means that the projection is the 0 vector. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, it still exists. It's just, it's just 0. Other questions? OK. <clears throat> Good. So I lost track of what I was, what I was talking about. Ah, OK.
Okay. <clears throat> so as a result of this projection discussion, So if we have uh, a little x, relatively little x for this drawing, and then a big y, and then the angle between these is theta, and this is the continuation of x. Then would you please, on your version of the drawing, uh, show where the projection of y onto x is? So, by the way, the reason why it's called projection, it, it, it's helpful to understand this, this diagram, is I'd like for you to imagine that infinitely far away, there's a, there's a sun that is like a star, I mean, over here. It, it, it's, thank you. That's, it's wearing its little infinity bow tie. That's how far away it is. It's very far away. If it, if it were to cast a shadow, wise shadow, onto this line, that's the projection, just like that device is a projector, right? So, so y casts its shadow onto this. This vector here. That one is the projection onto x of y. OK, so now, what do we know about the dot product from a few minutes ago? We know, we know a formula for this, right? What's the formula from a few pages ago for x dot y? Well, I agree with that. I agree with that, but what I mean is the one that involves angle. Very good. Length x, length y, times the cosine of the angle between them. Now, uh, let's consider here. Let's consider here uh, in this picture. In this picture, uh, what is what is the length of the projection? So assuming that this, is, that, that this is a positive projection, right? Y is over here and not on the other side. OK, what is, what is going to be the length of this projection? I'm, I'm fishing for some, for some Sokotoa stuff. Oh, OK. Right, so what do we have? We have, uh, we have what? We have this one, the length of y. And then we can solve for this one, right? So, so ka toa, right? C-A-H, I've got to remember it. What does that mean? That means cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So that's telling us that the cosine of theta is the adjacent, the length of the adjacent side, right? So that's the length of the projection. So the length of the projection uh, onto x of y over the hypotenuse. So the length of the hypotenuse is that one, length y. So that's Sokotoa business. Then now we can solve for the uh, projection. And we can come to that and determine that the magnitude of the projection onto x of y is this 
times the cosine of theta. <clears throat> okay, and this is, this is assuming for the moment, for the moment that zero is less or equal to theta is less than uh, or equal to pi over two. Because it ceases to be true for other ones, right? Why would it cease to be true in, in, for the, if this were not true? Because then in that case, this, this surely has to be a non-negative quantity, right? Same as this one. But then is cosine always positive? No, but it is positive for this part, right? Okay, so, so what I'm telling you is that, let's compare this this is this. Those are the same. In the case that theta is uh, between 0 and pi over 2. So what that's saying is that dot product is the length of x multiplied by the length of the projection. That's what it's saying. Then you can go through uh, the other case when uh, the angle is over here on the other side and you can determine that, oh, it's the signed length of the projection. So really, the dot product is always the length of x multiplied by the signed length of the projection of y onto x. That's interesting. So can, can someone give us a very succinct way to determine, to, to say, when is x dot y positive? And when is x dot y negative? Okay. I agree. I agree that it has everything to do with the angle between them. Yes? Yes. Very good. So, so in this case, if this is x, and this is y. And this smaller of the two sides, right? So here's, there's an angle over here, but we're always talking about the smaller of the two. So in this case, in this case, uh, x dot y will be positive or negative. Negative. Negative because if you, if you take x to be fixed, if you take x to be fixed, what's happening is that y is falling behind this dashed line. Okay, similarly, x, y, Here's this dashed line. What will be what is the sign of the dot product in this case? Positive. Okay, and similarly the last what's the what's the only case we haven't uh, haven't written down on paper on paper yet? Yeah, when they're when they're at right angles to each other. So, if that happens to be a, a right angle, then x dot y is 0. Okay, then we wrote that, it, there's a homework exercise that says that we've got a special notation for this occurrence. What's the notation? Perp. Yeah, that one. <laughs> it is denoted in this way, x and then perp y, perpendicular to y. Okay, so these, these two are synonyms. They mean the same thing. So, so here's an interesting question. Um, what is perpendicular to, say, 
uh, 1, 2. Negative 2, 1. Negative 2, 1. I agree. How did you do that? Magic. <laughs> okay, any less magic? <laughs> Yeah, if you have two num, if you have a vector and you want to come up with another one that's orthogonal to it, and, and if the vector has two components, if it's an R two, you can just swap the two components and negate either one of them, right? So then, yes. Uh, the matrix you gave for writing uh, the complex numbers is something like that. It's x y minus y x. Is that related? It's O three three. Yeah, well, it, it, it is, but not, not directly, not directly. Uh, it, it, and the, the, the reason why it is is because, as you probably learned in linear algebra, some, some matrices are uh, rotations. Okay. So, so those matrices, the M matrices, they're, they're the product of two things. They're a product of a scale and a rotation, so, which means that things remain at right angles. And now I lost what I was doing. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, okay, good. <coughs> Sorry? Making dot products perpendicular or something like that when you were going one, two, three. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, so if you want to, f if you're given a vector to find a perpendicular vector, you can swap two coordinates and negate, and negate just one of them. Now here's, So let's make sure everyone knows this trick because it's a fairly useful one. So if we have a vector AB, like so, then can you tell me another vector that's orthogonal to it? Right. Swap them. So notice that we swap the positions from AB to BA. Now, if we were to compute the dot product right now, what would the dot product be? It'd be AB plus AB. It'd be 2AB. So to get, it, to get it to work out so that they're orthogonal, terrific, right? Uh, fine. <clears throat> what if, what if uh, I give you this one? Can you tell me a vector that's orthogonal to that one? Ah, there you go. Both those two tricks together. The two tricks together. So on the one hand, you kind of want to just swap two of them, right, and negate one, because that's, that's the way the previous trick worked, right? So what if we do that? What if I say, OK, uh, I'll swap the first two and negate one of them. And if we were just to ignore the, others, the other two for a moment, it would work, right? So how do we definitely ignore the last two? Zero to zero. Yeah, zero everything else. Okay, there's an orthogonal one. Neat trick. Any question about this? Okay. So... Uh, Here's a theorem, the Schwartz inequality, SCH. So this is Schwartz's inequality. Uh, here it is, the statement. So <coughs> let x and y the elements of Rn, then here's the inequality. The dot product of these in absolute value. So this is one bit of the notation you've got to keep, you've got to keep track of. The, these vertical bars right here, uh, right, right there, <laughs> that you can just barely see. Is that absolute value or is that vector length? It's not clear until I remove my pinky, right? Okay, so now that I've removed my pinky, is it absolute value or is it vector magnitude? 
It's absolute value. Why is it most definitely absolute value? Because the result of the dot product is a scalar. Yes? Can we just say that really those are always the same thing? Because it doesn't matter. It should depend on what's inside. The operation mm -hmm. is always the same. Because it's either a positive length, strictly positive length, or a strictly positive quantity. Squared of the square of the... I, 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 you get no dispute from me. I'm in, I'm in complete agreement. But I, just having been, been to a rodeo more than once, I know that... Uh, students historically confuse these matters. Okay, so then uh, this is less or equal to the absolute value, uh, the, the, and, I, and I just did it, the, the <laughs> vector, vector length of x times the vector length of y. Okay, so now we're not going to prove this, but can someone give us um, a good reason why this seems plausible? Yeah? Okay, so here, here's the idea. This is not a proof. Now, we know, we know something that involves that, x dot y, and we know something that involves uh, the product of these two, but it also has a cosine, right? So here's the idea, is that, well, what if we look at that thing we know, x dot y is equal to length x, length y, cosine of the angle between them. Okay, so then, now, what is, what is the smallest value that cosine could ever be? Negative, Negative one. one. Right, it couldn't be, it can't be any smaller. What's the biggest that cosine can ever be? One. One, right? <coughs> so then, so then, uh, if, if it was exactly one, this would be equality, right? Mm -hmm. what, what is it, what would exactly one mean? Visually, they're pointing in the yeah they're parallel they're pointing in the same direction. The angle between them is zero. What if cosine were negative one? Cosine of theta were negative one. What would that mean geometrically? Yeah, they're they're anti-parallel, right? So they're they're they they reside on the same line, but they're pointing in the opposite sense. They're pointing away from each other. Okay. So we're going to have a nice exercise about this where you're not allowed to use this. Okay, it'll be, it'll be so fun. Okay, you, so this, I, this right here gives, you, gives the idea of plausibility, okay, that this should work. Okay, good. Any question about Schwartz? Okay, <clears throat> here's another theorem. The triangle inequality. Okay, so what's the triangle inequality? Very good. So, if again we let x and y be vectors, then the length of x plus y is less or equal to the length of x plus the length of y. Now, you can lose track of why, why this ought to be true. Uh, it's, it's really almost obvious, so long as you're dealing with um, Rn, this particular kind of vector space. So let's look. x plus y. If this is x, if that's x, and then remembering that vector addition is, is with, with arrows anyway, is putting things head to tail. Okay. And this is y. Then what's x plus y? Well, it starts at the, it starts at the furthest tail and ends at the furthest head, right? So first x, then y. So it would be this. Okay, now my question to you is, can you see those colors? Are they distinct on the thing? No. The length of the blue one, how does it relate to the length of the, X, the red one plus the length of the green one? 
It's got to be less or equal, right? It could be exactly the same if the red and the green and the blue were all collinear. Okay, but if you, if, when traveling from point A to point B, if you deviate at all from straight line, then that's longer. Right? So that's what the triangle inequality is saying, is that the blue one, you couldn't possibly save any time by going over here and going that way. <laughs> that's the triangle inequality. And then you'll, if, we, if I feel like it, I might give you an exercise to prove the triangle inequality too. So any question about this one? Yes? Um, does it still work if you have, you know, like uh, more, more than just two vectors? If you have like five or six vectors, that up, it, it makes sense. Like it it draw, does. Draw it, it does because, because you can imagine that I have infinitely many little red vectors and I put them all head to tail and I make them so fine that you can't even see the heads and tails anymore then it would look like this. So that's, that's actually infinitely many little red vectors all head to tail. And so now I'll, I'll add them all up. If these were all vectors and you added them all up, what would the result look like? The straight line between them, right? And then the question would be, the question would be, which one is shorter? The red or the blue? the blue, right? You could conceivably get the red to be the same if it was infinitely many little vectors and they were all lined up on the blue. Yeah, and all pointing in the same sense and none of them pointing backwards. Right? Because if you had some going and then come back and then, you know, like have you ever traveled to Houston? It's only about 200 miles to Houston. Okay, but I, I've achieved a road trip to Houston that took like 300 miles. <laughs> because, right, it's go, and then, oh, I forgot my whatever, and then you go get it, and then you go back, oh, I forgot my other whatever, and then, <laughs> yes? Uh, does this hold up for non-Euclidean surfaces? Did everything we're talking about currently is Euclidean. Okay. It's Euclidean necessarily because to be Euclidean means that we have the usual dot product. Anytime that the usual dot product is, is, is uh, in play, Euclidean. <coughs> Other questions? Okay. <coughs> Next. Okay. Definition. So, just, just so I... Uh, uh, know what happened in your previous linear algebra class. So matrix norm, have we heard of this? Yeah? From, from your linear algebra class? Not yes because you're a reader. A little bit? Not really. Okay. So we'll call it matrix length. So suppose that we have uh, A is a is, uh, is, I'll write an is, otherwise that's weird. A is an M by N matrix. Uh, with coefficients. A, I, J. Where I represents row and J in a column in the usual sense. Uh, we're going to define the length of A is well, I'll make it length squared so it's easier to write. Length squared is the sum from i is since, uh, so that'd be from 1 to m, sum, j is 1 to n of a i j squared. So can someone say what, can someone simplify what I've said so it's not so stilted? What is the, what is the length squared of a matrix? Yeah, you take all the coefficients, every one of them, one at a time, square them all up, and then add them all up. Just like, just like the length squared of a vector. You square all the components and add them up. So in that, in that way, we're kind of treating a matrix like a, a vector in that way. You square all the components and add them up. So then the length without square would just be me moving the exponent to the other side as a radical. Okay, good. Any question about this? 
Okay, and then a theorem that we'll need later that we won't prove today is the following. So uh, if we say that X is an element of Rn and A is M by N matrix. Oh, by the way, I don't think I've said it yet. Um, so note that uh, I appear to be writing X's in two different ways. And I appear to be writing M's in two different ways. Okay, that kind of thing. So that's not a, I'm not like losing my mind. Okay. Rather, rather when I write a math symbol, I write, I write those in scripty looking things with little serifs and feet so that you can tell that's the math stuff. And then when I'm writing an English word, I write it in print. Okay, so I'm just, just making that uh, comment so that you can kind of maybe follow what I'm doing a little easier. Uh, B is M by N. Uh, and then we'll say uh, A is M by N. And we'll also have B uh, is, uh, what comes after N? O, that's no good. How about P? P by M. <coughs> Matrix. Then, AX. So first off, is that a compatible, um, is that a compatible product? Mm -hmm. AX? It is, right? Because this is M by N, and this one is what? N by 1. Because remember, all vectors for us are, are columns. Okay, so then this, so ignore this for a minute. So X is an element of Rn. What is AX? It's an element of Rm. Why is AX an element of Rm? Right, because we're multiplying by an M by N matrix. So then now these right here, uh, this is a vector, and so this is vector length. That's what these vertical ones mean, vector length. This is less or equal <coughs> to A X. <coughs> so now, the, <laughs> these length bars, what kind of length bars are these? These are matrix bars, right? And what kind are these? Vector length, right? So this is... This is vector length less or equal to matrix length vector length. Yes? Do you just use it? I don't know if we're going to be using determinants at all. Um, we're going to, if, if we have enough minutes, so, we're going to. Uh, okay, so that like, does that mean that I use a different thing? I, I'll just, I'll just oh, we're not going to do vertical bars for determinant. This is, yeah. no. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, uh, also, uh, A, B. A, B? No, wait. Is this one compatible? No. No. The other one. So B, A. So is that a compatible product? Why is it compatible? P times... Right. So P cross M and M cross N. So the M's in the middle. Uh, match. Okay, so this right here is also less or equal to B A. Good. So all of these inequalities, the Schwartz inequality, the triangle inequality, these right here, for those of you uh, who like to know the names of all of these, this is called, both of these are called instances of submultiplicativity. Submultiplicativity. So the, the 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 matrix norms and vector vector norms are submultiplicative, which means that if you distribute the norm across the product, right? See how the see how the norm distributed across that product right there? Then it's less or equal. Very good.
So now, slight, uh, kind of significant change of pace. So a remark. So in the reels, from now on, so when you draw the reels, when when you when you give a give a picture of them, how do you draw it? With a line, right? So from now on, I know that it might be your habit up to now to put arrows on both sides, but you must stop that. <laughs> okay. The reason is because uh, from now on, and especially in this class, the arrow signifies the orientation of the object. So what this means is that this object is increasing to the right. Its orientation is to the right. If you draw arrows both ways, that means that the, as far as your drawing is concerned, the orientation is ambiguous. Okay? So from now on, you can only, you only draw the arrow to the right. If you draw the arrow going to the left, that means that we're talking about a line who's incre that is increasing to the left, which is a perfectly legitimate thing. Okay. So if this is the origin right here, so if that's the origin, and I select uh, a particular value, say this one, then is A positive or negative? Why? Okay. What if I put the arrow over there? What if I put it right there? Then is A positive or negative? negative. It's negative. Okay. That arrow tells you whether or not A is positive or negative. Okay. Now, we're going to imagine real numbers are actually little vectors. They're actually little vectors. Okay, that can be added up. They're sort of not interesting because they can't be turned at all, right? Okay, so there's, there's the kind of vector that, that is uh, pointing to the right. That is to say, pointing in the same sense as this. And how about, uh, how about this point? If this is B, then is B positive or negative? It's negative. Now, and why is it negative? of the orientation. Right? So then so that is to say if we look at the arrow representation of B, then here's the arrow representation of B, and it is in the opposite sense of the underlying space. The underlying space is pointing to the right, whereas B is pointing to the left, so B is a negative is a negative value, as the opposite sense as the space that it's in. So as a result, on the reals you can talk about length and you can also talk about signed length. So, what's the length of 5? Five? 5. What's the length of negative 8? Eight? 8. What is the signed length of 7? Positive 7. Or just 7. And what is the signed length of negative 10? Negative 10. Its signed length is itself. Okay, because, because its length is 10, okay, we can all agree on that, I think. And then the question is, is that, how about negative 10? Is it pointing in the same sense as the underlying space or the, uh, the opposite sense? In the opposite sense, right? It's pointing in the wrong direction. So that's signed length on the, on the number line. Okay, good. So now, suppose that we have the plane. And then when we're drawing the plane, how do we, uh, how do we denote it? Yeah, two orthogonal lines. And again, the same prohibition that I just said now applies twice, right? So you can't have the, you can't have doubly pointed ones. Okay. So suppose that we have uh, a vector here. like this one, and this is vector x, then using the, the technology that we already have, that we've already talked about a lot, we can find the length of x, the length of x, by computing the square root of the dot product of x with itself. Or just getting on a ruler, right? 
Now, can we compute the signed length of x? So, so there's a problem, right? Signed length with respect to what? So remember that when we were talking about signed length here, the question was, is, well, notice that the red one is pointing in the same sense as the underlying space. So we'll say that it's positive. And the green one is pointing in the opposite sense of the underlying space. So we'll say it's negative. Now the thing is, is that this space that this is sitting in is two-dimensional. So this has, this has to have a two-dimensional pointing in order for us to say that we're in agreement or not. Whereas what, what dimensionality is this? This one. It's one dimensional object, right? It's a one dimensional thing. So, so you can't have a notion of signed length in, in this particular case. Now, if, so I'm making a copy of the same thing. More or less. So if we say, okay, there's the x, and I want you to now consider this, consider this to be um, in the following con in the following context, that we have this, and I give you another vector by which we're going to measure x, and it's a unit vector, and here it is. So now that's a unit vector in the sense that it has length one, and then x has whatever its length is. So now that we have u to compare x to, now we actually can assign, we actually can assign a signed length to x, but only in comparison to u. What would be the signed length of x? Negative. Why would it be negative? Because it's pointing in the opposite sense of u. It's pointing in the opposite sense of you. But all that I did is just the same trick. I just said, well, yes, I know that we're in a two-dimensional space, but I'm just going to ignore all that and just look at that, and then it's a one-dimensional problem that we did five minutes ago. Right? Okay. Good. <laughs> I put another one. That should be a two, right? Two comes after one. So now let's consider R2 again. <clears throat> Now for R2, how many, uh, how many basis vectors are there? Two, two right? Yes? Uh, just for my understanding, since u is a unit vector, shouldn't it be denoted with a hat? Ah, so, so uh, I think you're saying that when a, when a vector happens to, to be the case that its length is one, that it's very common to write it with a pointy hat like this? Yes. Feel free. So I'll know what you mean, and so will the greater, but I'm not going to get into that uh, here. This is, this is a particularly common thing in um, physics, okay, which is a great subject. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Question? So in the one-dimensional example where you just have the real numbers, yeah. It's the, it's the same distinction as before, where you can construe points in a vector space to either be positions, right there, or increments. So increments, the little arrows, strictly speaking, I don't need to put it at the origin. So this, if I take this little red arrow and I pull it way over here, it, still ha it will still have length A, and it will still, it will still have positive length A. Other questions? Okay. <clears throat> so R2 has, uh, has two basis vectors, and they come in order, right? There's a first basis vector and also a second basis vector. Okay. <clears throat> so here is... R2. And then... What's the name for the first basis vector? E1. E1. Okay, what are, it, what are its coordinates? 1, 0, right? And so where is it when you draw it on this? It's this one, right? 
So this is E1. Okay. And then where's E2? Pointing straight up, right? But what I want you to understand is that it's an ordered basis. So I'm going to put E2 right here. This is E2. This is E2. And now we're going to circle back around and get this unit square. So just like this is a, this is a unit vector, okay, this is a unit square. And it now does have an orientation. It has an orientation, and this is its orientation. You follow the first one, and then the second one, and then come back around. So the orientation of this little two-dimensional patch is counterclockwise. Okay, counterclockwise. This is the orientation in the positive sense. This is orientation in the positive sense for the reals. Okay, now, notice that uh, if, if we were to follow E2 first, E2 and then E1, it would have orientation in the clockwise sense. So E2, then E1 would be like this. So now, I want you to imagine that we have, let x and y, how much time do we have? Plenty of time. Let x and y be in the plane. <clears throat> let x and y be in the plane. <clears throat> I want you to consider two possibilities. So we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're going to do the head-to-tail business, first x, then y, and then we're going to do fir first y, then x. So if this is x, and this y, what I want you to do is draw the par parallelogram that you would get by now traveling backwards x and then backwards y. So you'd get this. So now this is a two-dimensional object, and it has an orientation. What is its orientation? What is its sense? Is its sense uh, clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise, because you start here at the at where you begin at the at the at the most tail, okay, then you follow around and then loop back around. So we follow x first, then y, and then come back around. So this particular two-dimensional object, this two-dimensional object, of course, is a parallelogram, and it has an orientation. Is that orientation the same as the underlying space or the opposite? Same. Okay, now I want you to do exactly this drawing Except, instead of doing x first, then y, I want you to do y first, then x. y first, then x. we do that, oops. So again, we have this parallelogram. <clears throat> now, it also has an orientation in the plane. It has an orientation in the plane. Uh, will it be clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. clockwise, right? Because it says first y, then x. So we're going with the clock. So now, is this, is this orientation the same or the opposite as the underlying space? Opposite, opposite, okay? So this is a positive orientation. And this one is a negative orientation. Now here's where I have to ask a big question about your linear algebra experience. So, this shape right here, parallelogram, that's before linear algebra. I assume you know that. 
Okay. <laughs> parallelogram, parallelogram. Okay. Parallelograms have an area. They have an area. This one has an area. That one has an area. And suppose that I was able to draw these exactly the same, like, like I could copy paste it and they're the same except for the X and Y. Okay, but otherwise their areas are the same. So their areas would be the same. What linear algebra task can you use to find the area of, of these? Determinant. Determinant. Determinant of what? Of uh, the matrix with the column vectors x and y. Right. So you said because this is, these are in R2, that means that x and y each have two components. So if you wrote them all side by side, then you'd have a two by two matrix, right? You'd have a two by two matrix because you'd have one column that is x, another column that's y. Be a two by two matrix. The determinant of that two by two matrix in absolute value is the area of this matrix. Uh, thank you, parallelogram. <clears throat> so this is the determinant of the matrix that is first x, then y. That is to say, that is to say that uh, x is first, then y. That's what this one is. Whereas this one is the determinant of y first and then x. But I kind of want to put a bar between that because depending on x and y, this one might end up being positive and that one might end up being negative. Okay, interesting. So, do you remember the, the thing from linear algebra? What happens, what happens if you swap two columns in a matrix? What happens to the determinant? It negates its sign. Why? The reason is written right here on the page. If you do x first, then y, that gives you counterclockwise orientation. If you do y first, then x, it gives you the other orientation. Interesting. Interesting. So, <clears throat> now we have our first remark about determinants. Do we have time? La so here, here's the last thing. <laughs> Is that, suppose that we have the determinant of x1, x2, y1, y2. So that this column is vector x and that column is vector y. Then, how do you actually go about computing this? Very good. x1, y2, minus x2, y1. Right? The product, this product minus that product. Okay, and geometrically, geometrically, this is the signed area. of the parallelogram uh, spanned by first x and then y, like on the previous page. So if it turns out that the determinant, that that determinant is positive, then that means if you were to draw it, it would look like this. And if it turns out that the determinant is negative, if you were to draw it, it would look like that. So now try to think about how this goes into three dimensions. Because little two-dimensional things don't have orientation in three-dimensional space. You need three-dimensional things to have orientation in three-dimensional space. So think about that for Thursday. Have a nice day.